for the 19th. I just welcomed my wonderful students to the virtual class again. Uh, we had a little chit chat about normal things, and now we're going to uh, start the class. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to have some fun as always. OK, here we go. And as always, I ask if you guys can see my screen OK, just give me a quick thumbs up. Can you see my screen OK? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All righty. All right, so here we are in Blackboard. By the way, really nice on that assignment. I got a chance to go over it quickly. I gave you a lot of you guys, uh, you know, a, a mark for that and a good, good job type of thing. Uh, so very good. Let's keep that up and uh, keep doing those assignments. And of course, now we're looking at some of the bigger projects. Um, some of the projects, again, the best ways to either go to Gradebook or go to your uh, calendar, and from there you can check on your due dates and click on the assignments. So the next one is the movie poster. There's another assignment that I have to post as well for you to do. This is like my every other week assignment kind of thing. But this is the big one I didn't want to ignore because, you know, it is due in a few weeks. Um, I might give you an extension on this one, might, maybe till the end of the week or something. So we'll see how we do with that. So it's the movie poster project. All right. If you click on the actual um, link there, it'll tell you all about it. I did went over this briefly with you last time, but today I wanted to kind of show you more student examples. So movie poster basically could be any type of you know movie, whether it's a premiering movie uh, in the upcoming future, whether you're a big uh, movie buff and you went to the Toronto F International Film Festival, which is like the biggest one in the world. So uh, you could have kind of integrated some of that stuff as well, although it happened like a few weeks ago. Um, so it's a big event, of course. Could be a movie that's uh, maybe premiering on Netflix. Doesn't have to necessarily be the motion picture. So it could be like a Netflix movie, like one of those subscription channels. You got Disney, Netflix, and all the other ones, of course, Amazon Prime. So basically, you'll be designing a poster which will promote an event or a movie. So you can even put an event in there because we had the Olympics, let's say, and some other things, and you can also kind of integrate that idea as well. Uh, the main thing is to incorporate all the Photoshop techniques you've learned and to incorporate like a montage design creating this poster because there's no better way or other way to do this, you know, effectively and, um, and professionally. So showcasing in the near future, if you have a movie that you've kind of watched in the past and you want to recreate a poster, I've seen a few students do that one as well, and that's also acceptable. Um, uh, I do care about the theme, but I care more about what you show me, what you can do in Photoshop. So that's like the main, the main uh, part here. Okay. Uh, so of course you're going to use Adobe Photoshop, um, image editing and background techniques alongside other design methods to complement the overall presentation. You may also incorporate Illustrator if you want to do some vector stuff. Okay, like the logos or some of the more trickier things that you're learning with the pen tool. You can easily copy and paste some of those paths from illustrator into photoshop as well i will show you some of the integration from both applications in the near future so that's something that you're going to learn and also there's some vector tools in photoshop that we're going to be covering in the future and that's for your next book cover project as well yes i said book cover because that's your next project after this one and it happens during your reading week and you'll be creating a book cover which is another printed piece of project you're going to be working on very very fun okay so these are the criteria basically minimum of, of five different image sources i've seen students use up to like 50 okay not to say more is better it's just how you go about integrating different images and, and sources i want to see things like clipping masks a layer mask and quick mask these are some of the more advanced techniques that you're going to learn in the upcoming weeks we're going to start some of it maybe today or next week as well. Okay, so you're going to learn some of the layer masks uh, today, for example, uh, clipping masks. We're going to learn probably next week, but these two you're going to you're going to cover for sure. Uh, clipping masks is another assignment that I'm going to give you for that in the future as well. So even if you missed that one, don't worry, but I'm just I'm just basically listing things that you want to consider when it comes to um, applying them for this project. 
symbols, uh, layer styles and effects. This one is is pretty handy as well. It'll really um, do its purpose for the title of the movie posters. So I have some uh, ex exercises that will demonstrate that one also. And the color model, since we're printing it, it's going to be CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, black, the same toner cartridges you might have in your printer. Uh, you can always switch CMYK to RGB, which is meant for more like on screen or on like a digital delivery, where CMYK is meant to be a printed delivery. The resolution is 300 dots per inch, which is quite sufficient in order to capture all, all the good quality and, um, and pixels that you need for that type of dimension. And I put the size to be 11 by 17. Now, usually movie posters are a lot bigger. They're like 22 or 24 by 28. Some of them I've done in the past myself. Uh, but this is more like a user-friendly method to print it at your local printer. Some people like to print and frame this stuff. Uh, for example, you can go to like Staples, get it printed for like a dollar or two, and then go to Michael's, get a nice little frame, and then another five, ten dollars, and all of a sudden you have a nice masterpiece that you've done uh, for under 20 bucks, basically. Okay, so it's a nice way to to get your printing done. If you do large format, it's going to cost you a lot more money. However, let's see, you do want to scale this upwards. You can definitely make this a little bigger. For example, 24 by, I don't know, 14 or whatever the ratio is. And it won't do much, much damage to your quality because you're just scaling it slightly. You're not going from 7 to 30. You're going from 17 to 20 something. It's okay. Especially at 300 DPI. It does give you that leverage. Talent House is no longer there, okay? So I'm not even going to use that as a resource, but there was competitions there for movie posters and other items, and I did encourage my students. This was pre-pandemic. I know we have to kind of talk about pre- or post-pandemic, but it was around that time when Talent House was a big, powerful hub where designers exchanged ideas and, and competitions, and there was prizes and all kinds of stuff, right? So... Uh, if there's some other websites, please let me know that in, entails, you know, digital imaging competitions. I know there's always stuff out there, but um, maybe I'll have to be a little more. I got to look out for more stuff. Uh, it doesn't matter anyways. We're doing this for this class. I'm not out to get you guys engaged in competitions, but if you want to do that, if it's going to help you maybe boost your, you know, maybe enthusiasm or whatever. Sure. Okay. But the main thing is we're doing this for my class. This is a criteria, of course. It's out of 15%. So this is how we grade our, your rubrics. Criteria, did you do everything they asked you to do? Technical and creativity. All right. Uh, so this is due one week in six days. I'm going to make sure you get more than two weeks. So it's going to be two weeks, okay, uh, for this assignment project, I should say. Okay. So it's about two weeks for this one. You can get started if you want just after this class today. I'm going to demonstrate how to get this thing set up. All right. Uh, any questions, by the way, because this is when I get some questions from students about this. Let me quickly go back to my chat here. Any questions about this project? Uh, maybe after I show you some student samples, you might have questions, OK, because we'll do that next, I promise. All right, let's go ahead and um, do that part. Actually, it did have open two windows already. I'm going to dive into my, that's my UX class, fall Photoshop. I'm going to have to um, dive into my drive over here for this. Because I have to back up my computer from time to time. So give me one quick second while I pull this up. Why don't I do the, listen, we'll grab a break later. Because like I said, I'll do some pauses today with this lesson. Depending on when these people come with my stuff. Um, let's do the exercise first. And I'll show you the samples, the movie posters after. Like the actual student project deliveries. However, I do want to show you something even before that. Let's just look at some popular movie posters popular movie posters okay that are pretty much you can see which ones were done mostly in photoshop uh and yes movie posters 
I mean, you would technically use InDesign to do the type placement and the images and stuff because this is a Photoshop class. We're going to str strictly use Photoshop for this. But a lot of these Marvel movie posters, the epic movies, the Star Wars and the Matrix and stuff, they all use some kind of a Photoshop integration. Like this is a perfect example of how you can use Photoshop to create a, a montage of a movie poster like the Black Panther, for example. OK, same as Jaws. OK, this is more like a thing. This should make that effect. Although it is an older movie, they use some kind of other uh, traditional techniques to create more like a Photoshop look. And of course, from things like Ghostbusters and some other old classics, uh, you know, Blade Runner and Tron, you can see all these movies. A lot of them do use a Photoshop type of concept to get this to look. Even if they didn't, if it's more traditional the camera and design effects, it was a lot more challenging than it would be these days using a digital application like Photoshop, okay? And of course you have the Batmans and, and the other movies. You can kind of guess where I'm going with this. There's a lot more stuff you can um, look at, like Oppenheimer, for example. Right, so there's a lot of ways you can incorporate Photoshop to get these effects. Now, the level of delivery, I mean, I know some of you are learning Photoshop for the first time. Don't think this is what I'm expecting you to do. It'd be nice if I get quality of work like this. I do get a few students that did use Photoshop in the past, and some of them are really good at it. So, you know, every individual is different, but just do your best to deliver like a Photoshop type of concept, okay? Even like, uh, you know, like look at this kind of stuff too, right? There's a lot of different integration. It looks like an illustrator style poster, like the Suicide Squad, but I'm sure they use a lot of Photoshop as well, alongside with the digital illustration. So uh, this is pretty much, you can look online. As I showed my previous students, the same thing. You know, just look at some samples out there, see what you like and um, go for this kind of look because this is how you get most out of the Photoshop. Obviously, you're not going to do something like this, right? This is more like an illustrator thing. So if I was to ask you to do an illustrator poster, maybe that'll expect you to do because I expect you to draw the dinosaur, okay? Or the skeletal of the dinosaur with some of the lettering in the logo, some typography with some of the key line outline features. So this might be like an illustrator piece, whereas this is more like a Photoshop piece. So just kind of make sure you classify your work in the right zone, okay? Right. Even more simplified posters like this, you can have a lot of blend mode effects and some of the other Photoshop techniques that could be integrated with your um, poster design. OK, but there's no limits. OK, there's no limits to what you can do with uh, with a software and with your ideas. OK, so whatever you're into, whatever movie you like, right, like this kind of stuff. I mean, you have to use Photoshop right to get this done right. Like I said, uh, this inspired a lot of my previous students, just like I'm, you know, teaching you guys right now. And I'll, you know, for the year, for number of years that I'll be teaching this class, I've gotten some really, really nice results from, from a lot of students. So I'll show you some of their work and you can kind of compare and see, well, you know, it kind of looks good or professional or it's kind of semi-professional and you can be the judge of that, okay? All right, uh, even something simple like this, Silence of the Lambs. I'm sure there's a little bit of Photoshop uh, still you have to incorporate with some of this design. So even if it's simple, it can, it can still work. Uh, it doesn't have to be always like, you know, uh, over flooded with imagery and design. It'd be nice, of course, to see all the Photoshop stuff, but don't think I always get this from students. Uh, maybe similar, but not the same level of detail, of course. All right. So, like I said, let me plug in my drive. Maybe I'll get some students samples. If I find them quickly, I can show them to you now. I thought I had them on my computer. Because, you know, running out of storage, especially when you have like gigabytes and gigabytes of files that you receive daily. So, just give me a moment here and I'll get this thing started. So, while I do that, let's look at the exercise for today. Okay, so that's going to be under our. A blackboard so go back to content you should see if it's not available yet under class modules you'll have module number three it's already available for you to uh, explore so in that module we have the class 3.zip file okay last week we finished a really really special and an important 
exercise to get you more familiar with the selection techniques in Photoshop. Just a quick recap so you all understand, and a lot of you did upload your work, which is great. I always like to see you engage and, and participate in every activity. This is what we came up with, basically all from scratch. And I do like these exercises because they teach you from the bottom up. Basically, we have started with this and we ended up with that. Okay, and we had some fun along the way. And most importantly, we learned all the important intermediate, uh, you know, from basic to intermediate um, techniques into putting this thing together. Uh, the movie poster is not much different by putting the same copy and paste techniques, maybe some more blend modes and some more advanced um, uh, integration of tools and techniques along the way. But nonetheless, I mean, this is a good starting point for you to get this movie poster going as well. OK, uh, so today we're going to do another lesson, another folder, and we're going to learn some more techniques and some more uh, selections and other modes of, of, of using the software and to create our own composition. So let's go ahead and download that particular folder as well. Class 3.zip, if you click on that, it'll basically give you that material that you need for today. I'm going to go ahead and save this onto the desktop. Simply extract it when the folder is downloaded. And you have here the three folders that we're going to be exploring today. OK, and this is your last assignment. I'm going to have to post this one as well. It's putting a photo back together, doing some CSI magic. Um, this is called ripped torn. OK, so your job is to reconstruct the photo. This will be uh, one of those smaller assignments that I'm going to give you. It should take you no more than I don't know, perhaps maybe 20 minutes to get this 15 to 20 minutes to get this done. Uh, I'm not going to give you a timer on this. It's up to you, but you're going to do this probably later today when we finish. Uh, sometimes when we finish the class earlier, I'll leave you with something to do. OK, so this is something we're going to look at. And this is a powerful, you know, knowledge type of base of technique because, you know, when you can do this, you can reconstruct evidence basically. Uh, I'm sure the police and the government use the same tactics or techniques to reconstruct evidence on cases, whether it's legal or some criminal activities or something like that. Uh, you see this stuff in movies. You know, this is important, putting stuff back together. It, it, sometimes you might have a ripped document or a photo you want to restore, right? And this is how we can integrate the same type of, you know, um, principles and, and uh, tools and techniques to get it done. All right, now let's not jump the gun. We're going to go back to lesson two, which is the folder. It's called cutouts. This one entails us to follow these steps over here. So this is when we learn how quick masking works, and it is one of the criteria points for the movie poster project. Uh, quick masking is integrated with selections. So without selections, there's no quick mask. They kind of go hand to hand together. And we're going to use how to use the color range concept as well in terms of selecting color and establishing a proper selection. And I know there's better ways of, you know, with the new tools and stuff, other ways of selecting this, but learning this skill is very important and vital to you learning the application and its capabilities as well. We have another photo here. So we're gonna learn how to use multiple document integration as well, which again, paves the way for this movie poster project. So everything I'm gonna show you today after today's class, you can be confident enough to start the movie poster. And I will go over some of the setup procedures as well. All right, uh, lesson three. This is, um, I kind of throw this one in there. It's more like an advanced lesson of how to integrate alpha channels. Okay? And it's when you save selections and you can actually um, control how selections get loaded and saved and do some really, really important, uh, tedious, uh, technical, um, advanced techniques in Photoshop using this method too. It's something to learn for the future as well. So this is, I just threw it in there. This was part of L2, L, L3 and L4 folder. Okay, and this is all captured in lesson number three. All right, uh, before we get started, I'm just gonna quickly see if I have some of this stuff here. Oh, this is my backup drive. Okay, I'm gonna open this one here, no problem. Go to the other one.
right we gotta get this thing to finish now um all right let's go ahead and open photoshop you have any questions so far by the way If you if you feel more comfortable to ask questions after the recording, that's fine as well because I can't kind of do half and half. I got to either record or not record. So since this is recording, we are going to um, you know keep going forward unless we stop the recording. Sometimes we do do the you know intermission in the middle, and then we have a break, and then we come back. There's two sets of recordings we might have at times, but I try to keep it one so it's easy to upload one video. Because for me to go through all the process and stuff is also time consuming as well. All right, so no questions. Simply raise your hand if you do have a question. And if you don't, we'll just keep on going. This is the photo restoration. So this is due. I got to change the date on this one. This is supposed to be due. Um, I'm going to give you maybe a week for this one here. I'll make it visible so you can see this one right now. I got this dude. These due dates keep flocking around, so I got to change it back to today's date again. So we're going to go with this is September, September 26th. This is due next week, okay? You'll have some time after class to complete this. I'm giving you a whole week for this, okay? So it's a little bit of comfort zone. Some of you do need some time to practice, okay? So there'll be some assignments where I'll say it's due today, okay? And it's like a quiz or something quick, like a pop-up exercise, um, depending on what it is. But these ones I like you to practice because it's something that you know, it's a new skill you're learning. So I do want you to do a good job as well. I know the weight's only small. It's like three points, but it's still something that you might want to, you know, do a good job at. So it's due next week, this one. Okay, so 26th. I have a super basic question. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so when I open the zip files, the little zip envelope, can I just trash that or is, does that have any purpose? Yes, you can. Because okay. once it's extracted, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, who am, I, who am I speaking to again? Oh, sorry, it's Daniela. Hi, Daniela. So as soon as you um, extract it, I I do that myself a lot because it's way, just way too many files that build up. Just delete it. Okay. Yeah. Because it served its purpose. It, it copies its extraction in an, in an area of your desktop, let's say. It makes a folder, which then, if you keep extracting it, it keeps duplicating folders, basically. That's how they make malware and viruses on computers that's that's the trick of uh, getting people's computers all hacked <laughs> duplicate all these files so be careful when you download zip files from unknown sources gmail always tells you that in other email platforms so same way it duplicates every time you extract it so you can just delete the original and keep the folder that it was extracted okay thank you you're very welcome right All right, so this is the exercise here. You should see it now. Uh, you're you're going to restore a torn up photograph and assemble it together using a variety of selection tools learned in class. You will have time to do this near the end of the class. The file is attached with this note below. Good luck and have fun. So this is the actual PSD file. Um, let me see what it looks like to make sure it's the file. It's the same one in the folder, but I wanted to make it individual so you don't mix it up with other files. So if you just download this document, you can get started with this once we finish the lesson today. And if I open it up just to make sure it's the right one, you'll see. And going back to our folder here, if you go to your calendar and the due dates, there's your photo restoration assignment. Notice how it surpassed the due date. Um, oh, sorry, it, it went previously to the other one. Well, this one's due like in October. We're still in, you know, September here. So this is due like next week. The photo restoration gives you something to do in this class. And then the movie poster is due like two weeks after that or two weeks after today. All right. So there they are right there. You can access it and you can submit it the same way you did the other assignments. There it is. So this is the actual um, assignment or exercise for next week. 
okay? Again, I won't just throw this at you. I will show you how to execute it. So don't worry, this is something we'll do near the end as well. I'm just gonna close it for now. All right. So let's continue with this folder here that I asked you to download and extract that you just, uh, we just said, it's like, I do the same thing. When I extract this zip file, Mac PC doesn't matter. Well, PC be careful, because if you double click, it opens up kind of its own window, and then you can open the files in a zip folder. Technically, you can work with a zip folder in a PC sometimes without extracting it. I much more prefer you extract it and just work with the folder rather than the zip file because it does have limitations, I think, of some sort. So once you extract it, simply delete this in the trash. Now you have the folder, right? And there's the actual PSD document of the torn photo that we're going to use it as an assignment for next week. Let's open this folder now, and you'll see how you'll have um, three other folders in there. We're going to start with the first one, okay? So let's look at the PDF. I'm going to double click on it. I like these earlier exercises that I have. I've kept them because they're very insightful and very, very uh, knowledge-based. So you get to learn and read instructions, like open the file, select the background layer, select color range, leave the settings at default. With the color range palette, move the mouse over to the document to view the eyedropper tool. Uh, select OK. It's step by step, OK? And then edit in quick mask mode, right? So all these uh, very important things. And then asks you to open the other document and integrate the two to together. Now, as I do this, I'm not going to read it out. I'm just going to execute it visually to show you as we're recording the session. I'm also going to throw other additional things along the way, right? Because, you know, the, although this is a little dated, it still has very important information. And I will teach you some other techniques that are new that can kind of coincide with this one here. Okay. So I like the fact that it has all the steps written. I used to like, we used to print this and give it to the students. Now it's all digital. You can just look at it or just follow my video. You don't even need this if, if you don't want to read material and stuff. If you're the person who likes to watch a video. So let's go ahead and open these two documents. How do you open both at the same time? Well, they're both PSD documents. How do I know? I can tell by the extension. It has .psd. PSD stands for Photoshop document, just in case you didn't know. And this, this is also the Photoshop file, which means if you double click on a PSD file and you do have a, the application, it should automatically launch the program. If you don't, it won't necessarily open Photoshop. JPEGs usually open like a picture viewer program in Windows or Mac, same as PNG files. So be careful when you open those files because a lot of students get a little confused and say, hey, how come it's opening up this? So let's say I have a PNG here somewhere. Let me just open it up something on the desktop here. This is a JPEG file. So if I open up a JPEG file, it's going to open it up in preview. It's not going to open Photoshop for me, right? It's going to open this, this water texture ocean look in, in a you know preview software. Windows might give you a uh, think picture viewer. I forgot the name of the photo editing software. Windows has by default, but that's what happens. If you right click and open this in Photoshop, then you have control of what happens in terms of the opening of the file. OK, so just remember, this is how you can open up uh, documents in the right applications. When you have a PSD um, extension or let's say Illustrator or even InDesign, InDesign only opens InDesign. Photoshop only opens Photoshop and same as Illustrator. OK, so this is how it works. All right, um, so now we're going to open up this one and let's go back to the other one. Jump PSD, open with Photoshop or just double click on it by default. I want to show you how to work with two documents simultaneously. OK, so basically you have uh, one here, one over here. And how do you pretty much mix the two together? There's several ways. The drag and drop was the most common method back in the day, but Photoshop looked different before. Like Photoshop used to look like this, like there was Windows floating. So if you open up two files, Photoshop will show you two files. Now, since 2008, I believe, they introduced the docked system. So everything is docked together nicely in a fixed position. So basically, if I drag this here, see it turns blue and fades out. If I let go of the mouse, I'm docking it back into the whole application. 
it makes it a little more practical and easier in today's standards. Don't forget we have tablets people use and other um, smaller laptops and stuff, and you got to be able to uh, fit all these windows together, right? Uh, there's the other one here. I'm going to do the same thing, drag and drop. So now this is how they're, they're tabbed together, okay? So keep them this way. You don't want to do what I'm doing. I'm just showing you. Uh, you can explore if you like, but I don't want you to get stuck because if you do, you have to go to Window and access the windows this way if you can't see it. Let me do that one more time because it does happen. Let's see you have a window floating. When you click on the application, well, how do you get back to that window now? Because it's kind of there in the background. One quick way to select or access windows, you might have maybe three, four documents open at the same time. If you don't see them show up here, you can rest assured because everything under window is under the window menu. See, all the windows should be at the bottom that are currently open in the application. So you can open up cutout, jump, or whatever document you want. And then you can either drag and drop it or you can dock it back to the application. So now I have two documents that are tabbed or docked together. All right. So the main emphasis of the exercise here is to incorporate quick mask with selecting color range. Images like this are very tedious and very detailed, especially when it comes to the spokes on the bike. It doesn't matter what kind of tools Photoshop has with AI and everything. It's not going to pick up every little pixel. It's up to you, okay, to determine what is a selection and what's not a selection. So you can't always leave it to, I know last week we were exploring all the selection tools. We're going to continue that, but we're going to learn other methods as well to get more specific selections. So in this case, we're going to go to select. We're going to select color range. So this is the main um, selector for, for this particular model. We're going to go color range. And the way color range works is it's good for gradient settings like these. You have like a, like a light blue and a lighter blue color down here. And you have a little thumbnail of this window showing you what you're selecting. I remember doing this with a phone booth. I don't know if you've been to the UK, but there's a lot of red phone booths or red streetcars. So if you want to select that specific red color, you can basically do the same technique by selecting the color range. So color range selects a range of colors. You're going to leave it on the sampled colors by default. You can also go by different color specifics. Okay. These are more advanced and harder to manage. So sampled colors is a lot more you know, amplified and easier to, to use. So we're going to stick with sampled colors. The fuzziness basically is default at 40. I would leave that alone. And this is just localized color uh, clusters by more advanced type of selections of, of uh, targets and stuff. I'm just going to leave it at default for now, just to keep this simple. Cause if I went through every little setting in Photoshop, I would turn this into a 200 day course instead of a, you know, a, a 14 week course. So I'm going to have to just go with um, sometimes the defaults and you can explore what all the little check marks and buttons do because there's so many of them, right? All right. So we're going to just go over some of the important ones, of course, and get the job done. So here we go. We click on this. So my mouse cursor is looking at this window, but I'm targeting this color here. This is the blue that I want. So if I click, because if I click on the red, it's going to select all the red here in a little thumbnail. You see? Every time you click on a color, it selects that specific color. So my goal is select this blue here. Okay. Now this preview is a default black and white preview. You can get an image preview. I like the selection because it's really, you know, black and white. You can see what's selected, what's not selected. So if you start here, click once. Okay. And if you click on this little add um, to sample button, because you can go add or subtract. The trick is you hold shift. If you hold shift, it turns to this one automatically. So what I would do is click here, hold shift, click down here. So now I'm selecting a broader color. And then with shift, I'm going to click somewhere in the middle. And I'm holding shift and the keyboard. See how the plus button toggles on and off. And I'm going to go all the way to the bottom right corner. So now basically I selected all the background. How do I know that? Because it's selected in white. Or is it? Because you can invert the selection back and forth, whether you want to select the background or the opposite of the background. You might want to select 
the bike and the stunts person doing the bike stuff. Okay, you can do either or, right? Whichever way, you can always invert the selection. That's another thing I want to teach you with this specific exercise. Inverting selections is very important because a lot of times people just select the white background, go to select inverse, copy and paste. It's a very common technique in Photoshop by selecting. It's easier to select the background than to select sometimes the, the target or the image itself per se, right? Especially if a lot of logos and images have like white backgrounds or green screen. When they do movie effects on green screen, why they have the green screen? Because you can easily isolate the background. And now you have a superhero character flying in the sky because they got the green screen and the, all the projections and all the effects and, and, and um, modes and stuff happening. So same thing here, except this is not a movie production. We're just doing a selection type of... Um, configuration here so we're going to hit okay and you'll see now the background is selected the background right because that's what we did how do i know it's selected you can see these uh, marching ants i don't make this stuff up guys it's what they call them this is called the marching ants in photoshop you can see how the selection is established you can see the border is selected as well as what's inside the target which is the image if i zoom in you won't be able to see the outside so it's you know well advised that you zoom out command minus or command plus is how i use my shortcuts to make sure you see what's selected what's not selected in this case we can clearly see that the background is selected okay what we have to do now is select the opposite of the background we have to select the target okay what's this like the bike so what we have to do now to do that is we go to select and we hit inverse. Inverse selects the opposite. It's like inversing your, you know, t-shirt. If you have you ever put on your your shirt upside down or your socks or whatever, it's the opposite. It's inversed. So you can inverse back and forth. Look what happens. Inverse. Now the background is no longer selected rather than the bike. If I do select inverse again, it does the opposite again. Select inverse again. It goes back and forth. It's such a common method that there's a shortcut affiliated with inverse. It's Command Shift I. If you're using a PC, it's Control Shift I. So that's how you select inverse. I'm going to do it right now. Inverse, 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 inverse. Once you inverse the selection, you can then go ahead and copy and paste it. Let's just hit Command or Control C. Click on this image over here and do Control or Command V, right? You can easily grab one image from one, place it to the other. But the problem is when you do that, not necessarily everything was captured the way it was meant to be. For example, if you look at the details of the bike, it missed a lot of the spokes from here to there. I mean, it doesn't look that bad, to be honest with you. I can probably get away with this. It's good enough, but let's say you're doing a professional um, delivery and you want to make sure all the colors are captured and all the details and nothing was left um, behind. Like, let's say you have a cat with whiskers or hair. That's another advanced selection that you have to do with very tedious precision. There's no magic way of doing it. You just have to do the work. So I'm going to press undo and go back here and show you how to perfect the selection. Because I know we know selections by now. We, we did this since you know week one with the basic abstract exercise. And then we did the melon stuff last week with more tools and stuff. Now we're using more practical menu-oriented methods, uh, sampling colors and applying selections in other ways, not just you know the tools and stuff. But even if you use the tools or the menu methods, whichever way you choose, the ultimate goal is to actually eventually go to quick mask mode and perfect the selection so to go to quick mask mode that's why i want the tools to look like this because if they're like this you can barely see what i'm trying to explain right now so please make sure your tools are set up in the two column configuration so you can easily go over here and edit in quick mask mode now this is another popular setting like a button call it the on and off switch just like the selection I did, inverse, inverse, right? This one is also activate, deactivate. If you press the button, okay, everything else turns like a reddish color, okay? 
So if I press it again and again, it does the same thing. Don't double click because then it'll change the default color. You can change it to green, let's say, because sometimes if you have a red apple, it might conflict with the red. Maybe green is better for this one. So double click changes the default quick mask color. And I'll show you what this color even means and why is even there and what's the point of this whole thing to begin with. But right away, I'm looking at this and saying, wait a minute. I sh I, let's not inverse the selection just yet. Let's go back to select inverse. It's just easier to apply this method when you have a more concentrated um, type of target to work with. So basically, I should have left it alone from the get go. Instead of doing inverse back and forth, just don't do it yet. Now that you know what it does, put it back to where it was. So it's selecting like the background, basically. When you do that, I'm going to press D for default so it's black and white. When you select the background and you press Q, okay, what the quick mask will do is inverse the selection or the target that you're masking. It just does that. By default, this is red, so I'm just going to go back to my default red color so we don't get all mixed up and stuff. Okay, Press Q. So Q on and off. Q, I'm pressing Q repeatedly to show you how you, you enter quick mask mode and you exit quick mask mode. Now, just like selections, it's so powerful that when you make a selection in Photoshop, it ignores everything else. Same as quick mask mode. When you're, when you're in quick mask mode, everything revolves around quick mask mode, especially the brushes. The brushes are the, are the most powerful, or formidable, you know, um, friend or foe, I should say, is the most um, um, powerful acquaintance to execute the quick mask because what the brushes do is they they perfect the actual selection by using a black and a white additive or a subtractive application so if i have like white on top of the black foreground color what it'll do is it'll take out the quick mask what you want to do is you want to add not subtract so you simply press x see how x switches the white and the black so now that you have the black, and make sure it's 100% black, that will add more to the mask that you want. It's like a spray can spraying primer on something. There's the mask. There's the part that it missed right here. See? It missed some parts over there. So you see, it's not perfect. Because if you're doing a professional job, you want to make sure all the pixels are selected. And sometimes not all these methods work. You have to literally, you still need human intervention, OK? No, 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 it doesn't matter how powerful AI gets and all these other cool, fast, easy techniques. You still have to go get in here and get your hands dirty, as they say, right? And get the things done on time. Sorry, how do you select that mask again? I mm -hmm. I had a problem with my Photoshop and... Yeah, no problem. I... So do you have a selection already established? Because if I press yes. Q right now, it's and you, you're selecting like the background, right? Mm-hmm. Press Q on the keyboard. Q. Ah, okay. And what's is it red like mine or is it a different color? Default, it should be red, the mask. Mm. Yep, it is. Yep. So remember these shortcuts, everyone. Okay. So Q, quick mask. Okay. Just write that down somewhere if you want to remember it. These are important because they're going to be used a lot of times. X switches black and white. X switches your foreground and background colors. And X in Illustrator switches between your fill and your stroke. And if you're in InDesign, it does the same thing. So X is the universal shortcut to switch your color palette, foreground, background, a stroke fill, whatever the attribute is. Another shortcut, B is for brush. Okay, so if you press B, you're selecting the brush tool. And no better way to control a mask such as this one by using a brush. Now my size is like 10 pixels, maybe sometimes 15. And my hardness is going to be increased to maybe 85%. This will give me a good leverage and a good um, brush stroke weight to get all the details that I needed. As you can see here, a lot of these details were not captured. See, like all this stuff here. So this is when you have to do some, some finite stuff here, right? Now, let's get to the spokes part because this is what gets really, really tricky. Uh, I, I said the whiskers on the cat comment earlier because that might be the case as well if you're doing a, a, a cat selection or whatever, right? So let's say I have this selected now. See, I missed a few parts here. 
I'm going to now choose even a more a precise method by using the pencil tool. So the pencil is basically as small as you can go, as small as uh, one pixel. One pixel. You can't get smaller than that. There's no, no such thing as a half a pixel, right? So with this one, you get to draw straight lines and get all the little pixels that are missing. Now, I don't know about you. I'm still drinking my coffee here. I'm trying to keep a steady hand. But even if you had a lot of coffee and your hands are jerky or whatever, how do you get a straight line perfectly across? So here's the, another technique you're learning with this. Holding shift. So if you click here, if I, it's like connecting the dots. If I click here, oops. If I click over here, see I'm clicking in this area here. I'm gonna press the space bar so you can see my cursor. If you click here once, and if you let go of the mouse, and you go to the other side that you want to connect the line to and you hold shift it'll basically create this connection point basically if you keep holding shift and you do this it'll keep drawing uh, lines that connect the dots together i'm going to press and do be careful how you utilize that but it's really really good for geometrical type of selections especially when you're doing straight lines and geometrical um, outlines and selections and things like that so shift click shift click shift click and this is how you can get pretty much all the fine details of this uh, selection don't hold shift you have to let go you have to know when to hold it so in this case i press here i hold shift i press oops i missed it there so click shift click and I let go of shift because when you have to do is establish a new position, a new position is established here. I hold shift again and then I connect it. I let go of shift. I press again here. Then I hold shift again. So it's a lot of click release, click release method, but it works really, really well with this um, selection process. Now, not to get too tedious with this, but you can just by doing all the stuff here. And some of these colors are really hard to recognize anyways. We can see now what we do as humans is a lot more versatile and, um, you know, precise than, you know, the computer can possibly generate. Because no way um, the software can, um, can establish the differential between those pixels and the ones it was trying to select for us. This is what I'm trying to show you here. Like ours... We're, we're, we're still very important in this whole ordeal, okay? It doesn't matter how, you know, AI becomes. I mean, I know it's getting to a point where they can do a lot of cool things, but we still need to be in charge, basically, okay? Otherwise, you're not going to get the best results, period. Hi. Once we get all the details, yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, Prem, actually, I did not get uh, how are you doing this. Like, I did, I did press Q, and after that, I did not get how are you like highlighting the things which are not uh, properly selected. All right. Uh, so basically, um, you are in quick mask mode, correct? Yeah. You're here, yeah. right? Are, but, and you're using the brush or the pencil? Somehow my way. image looks different. I don't know. I'm sure I followed the steps, but it looks different. Can you share your screen, please? Can you see my screen? I can see your screen. So, yeah, what you have to do is basically um, go to the brush tool, B for brush. B for brush. Yeah, just, I just, did. But you're not on the brush tool. You're in the, you're in the other, you're in the selection tool. Is it just you, control B? No, just B. Just B by itself. A B by itself, see? Just press B on the keyboard. No control, no alt, nothing. Just B. Just press the B, the, the B button. I did. I am pressing. I think my app is stuck. Hmm. Okay, then select the brush tool. It's located right uh, further down. It's a first row, uh, sixth tool. That one, yeah. There you go. Okay, so basically you have to be in the brush tool keeps going there for some reason that's weird it's funny, do me I'm a favor the same problem i'm having that exact same problem <laughs> okay but weird. you guys are in the, in the brush tool right uh 
Well, I'm pressing the brush tool, but for some reason I have a, a black circle. It's oh yeah, like you. There we go. That's what I have. Yeah. That, okay. Okay. I was and keep keep a, a keep spraying. Button. Yeah. So keep spraying um, now the actual uh, method there. Keep spraying. Spray. Yeah, like you're spraying the brush. Like pretend it's like a can of spray. You're you're airbrushing the oh, area. Yeah. I'm airbrushing. I see some black happening. There you um, go. Okay, so how do we go and, oh, and get those so the, smokes? The black represents the red. Uh, just so you know, black and white mean black means you're adding the spray. You're spraying red. White means you're taking away the red. So don't just kind of think black means it's black. It's red, actually. It's an application the way Photoshop works, positive or negative application of the mask. So black means you're applying it, which is in this case, the red and white is not applying it. So if you keep zooming in, Prem, you're doing a good job there. You just get all the details. Now, please don't spend an hour doing this. This is just the, me demonstrating how useful, how practical this technique is. Um, you can spend the hour doing this in something more, you know, uh, meaningful for you, like maybe your projects and stuff. But for this, just so you get the hang of it, yeah, get a few of those things. Prem, make your brush smaller now. Pick the pencil, for example. And how do you make the brush smaller? Right away, one pixel. You can go up there. Uh, the pencil is located underneath the brush. So go back to the brush tool. Click on the brush tool. Yeah, select the pencil. Click there. No, you're in the brush. You were just there earlier. Go back. Go back up. You got to hold the mouse pram because there's other tools inside there. You, you, you already have the brush selected. Click on the same tool that you're on right now. You got to hold the mouse. Yeah, hold the mouse. Hold the mouse down, click and hold there, pencil, right? So that's a lot, lot more finite. If you zoom in, you can get more details now, okay? Now try shift clicking from A to B. Basically, click there, hold shift. Don't hold shift. You have to actually click, shift, and click again. Don't drag the mouse, just click. And then, right. But if you click from one point, so for example, um, Prem, here's what I want you to do. Cl click on one, just click once on one of the points. Click once, yeah. And now hold shift and click on the other point of the other side. Click, there you go. Okay, so you understand how that works? You're connecting the dots basically. So by doing this tedious process, you are, you're going to get all the straight spokes in this case, the straight lines. You got to get used to it though. So you got to just go click, let go, shift, click, let go and back and forth. Okay. All right. I think we should, I think you figured yeah, it out. Thank you. Yeah. Very yeah. Good. Excellent. Thank okay. You. Very good. So I'll go back to my screen now. So now that we got all the details and I really encourage all of you, like, if, you know, like Prem asked the question, if you guys are stuck, um, you know, once we do it a few times, you can always practice it and, and execute it and stuff. Okay. All right. See this guy's here. All right. Once it's all said and done, then again, don't don't spend more than you have to on this. But this is just a demo, right? You're not handing this in, so please don't worry about it. This is me demonstrating the technique. Once it's done, what you want to do now is exit quick mask mode. See, Photoshop, it's like day and night. Right now, we're like in night mode, okay? To go back to day mode, like Photoshop mode, press Q, and now you're back to selection mode, right? Once you're in selection mode now, what are you selecting, the background or the target? The background. So what you want to do is you want to go select inverse. Now you inverse selection and watch how it selects the bike instead of the background. So once that's established, then you can do command or control C. You go to the other background and you do control or command V to paste the image. And this, my friends, is now if you zoom in there, you can see all the little details that that no matter how advanced these programs get that only you can control as a as an, a digital artist in the software. Now that we have the bike all extracted, 
we can easily go to you know free transform we can make it bigger or smaller we can rotate it and we can do lots of other things to accompany this image okay all right very good so that was the whole premise there and uh, and i covered all the steps that were listed under this handout here basically quick masking brush sizes uh, you know copy and paste Another way to move the, I just want to show you one more method. Let's say this method is something that you want to try something else, let's say. Without selecting it, you can do copy and paste. So this is the bike. How do you move this here? How do you do a drag and drop method? The drag and drop method works good if you have the image departed so it's like that and then you drag and drop it here right that works but that's very hard to do for some people for some reason okay just moving windows around and stuff so another way to do it is to actually so i'm showing you three ways the first one was the best one copy and paste you can't go wrong with that but if you want to do it this way you literally have to trust your judgment on your you know mouse and hand coordination and all that stuff so what you do is you drag this watch this hold the mouse drag it to this tab keep holding the mouse drag where you want it to go and let go of the mouse so that's like uh, the instinct type of method so whichever one you like the best you can do drag and drop i like copy and paste it's, it's easy and it works and you can do lots of other things with this all right, I'm going to save this now because this is the finished version. So we're going to do save as. Jump. Finished PSD. Save. All right. OK, now before we move to the next one, I do have to do that little thing I mentioned earlier. So give me one second. Grab a five minute break. We'll be right back for the next exercise okay so five minutes i'm going to keep recording i don't want to stop the video so this gives you five minutes to do whatever you have to do okay so i'll see you guys in five minutes okay all righty see here it's one of those days today okay so five minutes i'll be back let's 1005 okay so it's 9 58 1005 we'll be back here see you then
Oh. Apologies for the delay, everyone. I did get uh, a lot of the stuff done, though, so that's good. At least it's out of the way. All righty. And everyone's back. Okay, hope you guys had a nice little break. We'll do this from time to time just to get a little, little breather. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again, and we'll continue. I think it's already being shared, actually. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Perfect. All right. So we're back to the second folder. We just finished executing this one. We learned a valuable, powerful technique in Photoshop, how do you incorporate selections, not just any selection, but a color range mode selection using a menu and incorporating a powerful technique called quick masking. Very, very, very um, useful in many different situations. And a lot of professionals integrate quick masking as a tool. Look, if you want tutorials on this stuff, you know, Adobe's got tons of quick masking tutorials, quick mask, Photoshop, you know, just even, even, even if you look, look, it even Google even tells you to press Q on your keyboard. If you go to like videos and stuff, there's all kinds of different quick mask mode uh, tutorials you can look at just as an addition to what I'm showing you and doesn't doesn't hurt to practice more methods or more um, examples on how this is done but this is a very popular method in photoshop and it definitely gives you more control and leverage on your selections okay this is the miscellaneous lesson uh we'll go over it just to kind of show you what it does uh, this is how you can control uh content aware scale okay so I'm going to go ahead and show you that one just to show you an example. And maybe I'll show you how to execute it one day. I'll do an ex extension of this one. So if you open this up, you'll see exactly where I'm going with it. Uh, there's a picture of a photo. It looks like one of those destination weddings. Okay. We'll call this the bride on the left here. We'll call this the bridal party or whatever, the group. And the trick is we're going to go on review and turn on um show the guides okay now the guides is command apostrophe same shortcut as illustrator indesign photoshop okay if you hold command and you put the apostrophe or the semicolon it shows the guides and the grid is the apostrophe the guide is the semicolon that's how you can control the actual um visuals for these things what i want to do is transform the image so basically, let's say you have a parameter or a dimension that you have to fit this image onto, like a picture frame, let's say, and you have to resize a photo. This happens every day. The other day, my friend called me. He's doing like a Facebook page and he's like, you know, how do I make this, this thing fit? It's not fitting on the, on the banner or whatever the business thing is doing. I just told him to go to Photoshop and resize it, basically. Sometimes you have to match the width to a certain dimension, whether it's social media, whether it's print on some, or some other avenues. You got to be in control. So if you just do a simple, you know, edit, you know, free transform. What happens is when you do this, Obviously, this is not the right way to do it because everybody just got taller and thinner and you skewed the image, distorted the image, actually. OK, so this is a no, no. You can't just resize images based on what you think. Right. So that's what you don't do. OK, but how would you do it in a way so it doesn't distort the main focal point of the image, in this case, the people? So what you want to do is incorporate this very advanced technique that Photoshop has even before like AI became into full effect as it is right now it's becoming more popular Photoshop always had an AI algorithm built in it's under edit content aware scale so once you select this option here what happens is Photoshop differentiates the subjects with the background as soon as you do this what happens is everything kind of stays together so it does work okay to a certain extent if you go too close obviously it does to get distorted but if you go to some degree of doing this you can get away with it and nothing gets distorted actually okay well i shouldn't say nothing because something does get distorted to be honest with you if i was to zoom in you can see um where was it there we go 
see your hand, right? So you can do find flaws in this AI generated system as well. I mean, even AI itself, you see some of these image generations, how it deforms the hands or the fingers. It can't, it's not perfect yet, okay? I don't think it's always gonna, always gonna be 100%. There's always gonna be a flaw. Even humans, we all have flaws, right? So this is how this stuff doesn't really work. But in the other example I'm gonna show you is how you can prevent this from happening. So again, human intervention to get AI to work with you in conjunction with getting these to work. So let's look at the next example, which is this one here. This is without help. This is with help, okay? So what happens here, there, here now is if you do the same thing, if you go to edit, you know, content aware scale, with this image, it's harder to differentiate the background because it's not like water and a beach. It's got like trees with with heavy, you know, forestry and some other stuff. The color tones are more matching. AI's got a harder time doing this than the other image for some reason. So if I was to do this, look what happens now. Different results, right? Like, like the other one looked at least, you know, pretty decent. It looked okay. This one does totally not look okay, okay? Really bad. So what happened there was basically AI couldn't really differentiate the background and the people and everything else. So what we're going to do is incorporate our human, you know, addition to AI and hopefully get this thing done properly. The way we do that is we make a selection of all the people we want to preserve. So we would go to, let me show you now, remember quick mask mode? So you go to a brush tool, you go to the brush tool. Now, if you don't select quick, I'm using the square brackets to make the brush smaller and bigger here right if you don't press quick mask mode what's going to happen is you're going to spray whatever the foreground color is black in this case right but once i press quick mask mode i press the letter q on the keyboard notice how it says it says mask over here rgb over here so when you press q it says mask or quick mask that means you're in quick mask mode also this button looks pressed also this button this layer looks highlighted so quick mask mode gives you a lot of visual indicators that you're in that mode so you have to understand when you're in that mode or you're not in that mode so once you're in quick mask mode you can then go ahead and select your targets and make your selections so I would basically do this. I'm gonna do a quick job here so I can show you. I would select the other person as well. And I would select this person here. So I do all that. I press Q. I go to I go to standard mode from quick mask mode back to selection mode. I go to select inverse. So I select the people and I go select and I save the selection. So when you save the selection, what happens is it goes in channels and what you do is you have this thing looking like this. So I wanted to show you how this was prepared, not just to wow you with the magical, you know, outcome, but just to show you how this is done. So you make a quick mask or you make a selection in this case, a quick mask, cause no way you're going to use methods of other besides, um, you know, you gotta use quick mask for this. It's very hard to differentiate these pixels, especially when you have like these kind of backgrounds. You really have to get in there and do a human human um, application, not just an an application. So you do that. You save the selection, and one day I will go over alpha channels more in depth with you. Right now, I just want to cover the surface of it so you understand the capabilities of Photoshop. On that note, let me tell you something else. When I learned Photoshop, I was just lucky layers were introduced in the late 90s. So uh, basically layers was like the biggest thing, the biggest thing since sliced bread, okay? That's how layers were very powerful because you can just move one layer to another. Before you couldn't do that, before everything was done in channels, that means you copy and paste selections on top of one another and you're stuck with it. You can't really go back maybe in one or two steps but it's very, very methodical in terms of planning. So as an art director, you have to plan the whole concept before you go ahead and put it together. You have to do drawings, thumbnails, even today you have to do that. Once you have the plan in place, you copy and paste the images strategically in a way that everything layers on top of each other, like they did back in the older days. So that's how we used to do, you know, montages and designs in Photoshop using channels. When layers came out, it was a game changer. We don't have to really use channels. We can just resort to layers. 
But that's not to say channels get ignored altogether because channels is still the most powerful component of Photoshop in terms of selections, saving selections, integrating selections, saving transparencies for other applications with other formats, paths as well. We're going to cover all these advanced topics in the future, but right now I'm just surfacing the channel conversation so you understand how it works. Either way, do me a favor. Do not click on these little visible things because it can really kind of... I know it looks like a cool effect, but we're not here for the effect. We're here to see what channel green and red is preserving through a visual. Just don't mess around with these. Just click on other RGB or click on the channel in the middle position here. Don't play with the eyeballs, okay? So either click here or click there. So now how that you understand. I activate, sorry, how can I activate that channel option? I only have the layers. I don't have. So so go to, oh, you don't, you don't have this available? Channels, uh -oh. go to window and look for the channels right here. Mm, okay, perfect. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And then there's like usually layers, channels, and path travel together like this segment here. This is a together kind of palette, okay? And that's how, whoops, I'm going to move it over here now. Ah, <laughs> look what I did, guys. I messed up my whole thing. As a matter of fact, I'll mess it up even more. Okay. How do I reset it back to normal? I go to window. I go to workspace. And I go to reset Thursday, September 12th. Remember, we made our own workspace. Look back to normal now. And like I said earlier, layers, channels, and paths travel together. So channels, you can select the scale channel or go to RGB. Always, always go back to RGB before you go back to layers, always leave this like this, okay? Because this captures all the red, green, and blue channels that gives you millions of pixels to look at. Otherwise, without these channels, you, you won't have the colors that you're looking at, right? RGB, red, green, and blue, and the combination of those gives you millions of colors. And this is a saved selection. But the reason why I'm showing you this is so you can see where it's being stored. It's not some kind of a magic, like well, what's going on here. This is behind the scenes, so you see what's happening. This is a saved selections in the channels. So when you go back to layers now, sorry, let's reset it back to RGB. When you go to layers now, and you want to do the technique I'm trying to get to here, which is, remember, perspect content aware scale, and you, and you do this, and, and things don't work out. You're like, well, you know, what's happening here, right? So the way to make it look perfect is to incorporate the alpha channel that was saved in conjunction with this method here. So what you do is you go to um, edit, content aware scale. This is basically an algorithm or AI built in uh, module in Photoshop, which understands the background or the content aware type of situation. It's not perfect as you see, but with our intervention, it will be close to perfect. So when we do that, what happens next is you have to go to protect. Now you're going to go to protect scale. Now this is not made up. This is the name the alpha channel was given. If I rename this and call it something else, this will be called something else. You understand? This matches the name of this. That's all. So it's not some kind of technical word. Okay. So protect I could have put, you know, teenagers or, you know, kids in the forest, whatever. So scale was the name. So now I'm protecting that selection that's integrated with this with this file, which means if I scale this now, guess what? It's protecting that particular area. It's like freezing those pixels so they don't get stored. Okay? Really powerful technique. And now you can see how channels are quite impactful when it comes to uh, preserving pixels and you know to not get distorted with other methods of of applying the program and of course if you press enter this is how we do the actual uh, effect all right okay so that was the lesson there and the difference between using channels and not to use channels and you understand now how that works and how to make channels i'll, I'll give you a quick little a brief on how to do that. Saving a selection will make a channel. We're going to cover channels in another lesson, just more in depth, and maybe I'll I'll bring this challenge up another time and show you some other interest. In, maybe we'll fix the arm situation and stuff, okay? So you can learn how that works. All right. So next is, and this is, again, just taking you through the steps.
This is the actual um, assignment that's due next week. So I wanted to show you this one. This is called Rip Torn PSD. Uh, after this one, I'll leave you to work on it. I still have to show you those poster student examples. I do want to do that as well. So we do have two more things left on the agenda to do this, to demonstrate how this is done, and to show you some student samples. So let me just see if my drive is ready so I can show you that. 88% done. Okay, it's almost ready. When this is done, I can plug in the other one and do it. Maybe I can do it simultaneously. Too many drives. You know, there's only so much storage space on these computers. I have to have like gigabytes and terabytes externally hooked up to um, kind of back up all these things too. All right. Do the same thing. I mean, when you guys are you know, running out of space on your computers, get a external hard drive or probably a drive is a good idea. You can get a good one these days for good value and you can have extended storage easily just by saving your stuff. So your computer will function more flawlessly because when it's full with storage and limited stuff, it does get wonky a little bit, right? Okay, let's go and do this one. And then when I leave you to it, I can show you some samples along the way. So this one now, learning all the techniques for today and last week and the week before that, let's let's apply all the techniques we've learned and reconstruct this photo back to together. Let's treat this like a crime scene or some kind of an incident. Maybe the 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 the, the skateboarder got injured and now we got to construct the evidence to make sure there was no foul play involved. Let's just pretend we're some kind of a, you know, special party here involved with this situation we got to reconstruct this photo now there's people that get paid to do this reconstructing not just evidence but photography there's another lesson i'll show you how to do re photo retouching and stuff uh, some students already know photoshop so they did add photo retouching on top of this i don't mind if you do that but i'm not going to take it to that level because that's another lesson altogether the only thing I'll show you is how to put this thing back together utilizing various selection techniques. Go ahead. I heard someone in the background for a second. If you want to ask a question. Anyone has any questions? And we're good. All right. So open this image up. OK. And the next thing I want you to do is to analyze each segment. So this is the top left corner, we'll call it. We'll name it as such as well. And we're going to, uh, in order to put this together, basically we're looking at this flat image. This could be like something you find on the floor, okay? You pick up the pieces and you you scan them on a, on a, on a flat scanner and then you incorporate this technique afterwards. At the end of the day, you're looking at one flat image, okay? Our job is to extract these pieces of evidence to separate layers and then basically um, compartmentalize the layers or basically organize it in such a way to um, kind of merge it back together so it looks like the real photo. The only way to do that is with layers and selections. And this is, again, the main the main premise of the lesson too, teaching you all these things, right? So we're going to use the uh, selection methods we use we used last week in conjunction with quick mask that I showed you today. So it's a good review of both and exposes you and reiterates all these important techniques. Let's start with the top left corner. Now I could use the lasso, but for that one, I mean, really, I have to really keep a steady hand. It's very difficult for me to get this thing to look perfect. So I don't think that's the best method. If I use the polygonal lasso tool, I mean, that might work, but the problem is I got to do a lot of clicks and clicks and clicks to get it look perfect with all these zigzags. It'll take me a long time. I'm not saying it won't work, but it's probably very tedious and quite lengthy in terms of execution. The magnetic lasso tool might be the best option for me in this category. I want to pretty much review all the categories again with this, so bear with me. The magnetic lasso tool might work. It should work because it will differentiate the pixels between this. See, I'm just going to go click. Keep clicking. 
you actually this does work actually pretty well because it follows see again let's look at ai and photoshop it does differentiate the blue pixels the green pixels versus the white pixels so it does follow i'm keeping a steady hand with my mouse i'm basically clicking at some intervals here and there and clicking here every time i change the direction of the flow i click I click and I click. So I was able to do that quite nicely. Is it perfect? No, because it missed a spot here, missed a spot here, some other spots there and there. So my my point again is to perfect any selection, whether we utilize the color range earlier with the motorcycle. Now we're use, utilizing the same technique with this. You still have to get quick mask integrated. So by pressing Q, we get to fix or repair the selection. So I'm going to zoom in. B for brush. Those are my shortcuts. B for brush and X to switch the colors back and forth. Now, this is something I got to take out. But rather than me doing this, I'm just going to click here, hold Shift, and click on this other side and get a perfect straight line. Basically, I did this. That's what I did. But at the very top, I skimmed the edge nicely so it's nice and clean, okay? As I zoom in here, I grabbed an area that I shouldn't have. So for that, I'll press X. X will change this to white instead of black, which will add as a negative, like a subtractive application. So it takes away the mask. Because look, at the end of the day, you want to take out the mask or you want to press X and add the mask. You're in total control. This is why professionals love using this technique because there's no way you can mess it up, right? Like it's so precise and so perfect. You can zoom in and get any pixels that you want. I mean, you saw me get the spokes of the bike, for example, right? This is how detailed this thing can be by the pixel, okay? So I'm just going to get close enough so I can demonstrate how effective this will be. And again, I'm doing this in conjunction with my normal selection routine. I'll leave a little white in there just because it looks like the torn piece effect. Once I'm done, I press Q, I exit quick mask mode. I'm back to selection mode. So this is like a pair of executions. So you use one, go to quick mask mode, exit, go back to selection mode, and then you copy and paste or command J, same thing. Remember last week we learned Command J or Control J. We can utilize that tech, uh, same command today or copy and paste. And this becomes a separate layer, which you're going to name top um, left corner. Okay. If I hide the background layer, what you'll see remaining is the extracted top left corner of my extraction. I'm going to use the move tool now. And the move tool is the follow up tool. You have to use it and just move it to a different spot. I want to move it up here just so it kind of moves away from the original position, just so I can tell it's extracted and it's free floating, ready to go. Okay. Now I'm going to hide the top piece layer and grab another piece and repeat the same process over and over again until I reconstruct the whole photo after. So I'm going to pause now because I can hear some noise in the background. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Helps if I go to my teams. I have a question. Go ahead. So when I was uh, using the, what is that tool? The magic, uh, one second, the magic lasso tool. I tried drawing, okay. In between, I made a mistake. So I couldn't go back. I did Control ZZ and then again started drawing again. Uh, is there a yeah, way yeah. like... Yes, there is. Prem, I'm so happy say, you asked that question. Show my screen. Yeah. yeah, watch this. Prem, good question. Watch this. So Prem did this and all of yeah. a sudden the thing went crazy, right? Did it do this on you? Yeah, yeah. And I was not able so, to leave it. It's just behind me. So you know what you do? You go grab another coffee and you turn off the computer I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right here's what you do you press escape once you press the escape button it resets okay okay then you do do it again i mean it's it's like a one-shot deal you know what i mean if it does get really messed up on you like honestly like you should get it 
and you, look, you can always fix it after. Even if look how fast I'm doing it now. I'm gonna go click, 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 and click. Right? Then you press Q, and then you fix it. If if it's it's not gonna be perfect, so don't expect it to be perfect because that's what the quick mask is for. Then you fix it using a brush tool. Right? Press Q, copy and paste. But you want to get it as close to perfect as possible, so you do the least amount of work afterwards, which is the quick mask mode, right? But okay. if, it's, if it's really, really bad, like if, if it's if it's like doing one of these on you, and you're like, okay, this is, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use this. Like, why would I even waste my time with this, right? So that's yeah. why you you press escape, you do it, you do another attempt. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I was hoping somebody would ask me that question actually because. Um, it happens a lot. It's a common thing, right? Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Any other questions? Very nice. All right. So don't be shy, the rest of you. I know I, I got the usual suspects asking me questions, but the rest of you, if you have any questions, please speak up, or I'm assuming everyone's doing okay. All right? So hey, glad Professor. to have you. Hey, how's it going? Um, I just wanted to ask you, I forgot that we undo by command Z, but how do we redo if we have undo a lot right so if you went back let's say um let me just for example i do this and this and this and this and this right i just went like five steps right now to undo you press command z command z command z right right but if you do yes. command shift command or control shift z you go forward command z back okay. command shift forward. so basically it's right here edit command shift z is redo undo redo undo right okay thank you if you're welcome good question again now watch this the history panel look at this you can go back in time when you started this whole exercise i can take a snapshot of what i am right now and continue later let's say i decide to take a different approach to my design what you do is you take a snapshot and then you can kind of take over from that point forward, like a new document, basically. But I just, honestly, I don't do that a lot. I just kind of continue where this is at right here, okay? So this is the history. You can go back and forward at any time. Does that make sense? So use the history, use the edit, undo, redo states to be in total control. All right, so we're going to move this here. We're going to hide it. I'm going to go back to remember the background layer just like last week that's our source our source is this reconstruct this photo last week we had some fun with a watermelon and a bunch of fruits and vegetables having fun putting things together now we're taking a more serious matter here it's a real photo something happened someone got hurt or whatever we have to reconstruct evidence and put it to real use we're applying the same skills in a different scenario and we're reviewing some advanced topics as well so back to this layer i go I already kind of exploited all these tools here. The best one was the magnetic tool. Moving alongside here, we have the object selection tool, quick selection tool, magic one. Magic one is good for like simple colors. It won't work in this case. I would resort to more of the quick selection tool. So between these two, my favorite would be the magnetic and this one here the quick selection tool because with that one you can literally go basically click inside the image click and drag the mouse and after a few clicks look it stops here let me show you see q right so if you keep going let me get rid of this generated fill thing because it's annoying for now i just went hide bar by the way there we go there we go press q look at this it's almost perfect but I want you to practice all the methods you've learned just because they're all important. I don't want to tell you one method is better than the other because it's different. In some situations, the magnetic class tool might work better than this tool. It's just the edges are better accepted. For this one, it's more like the, the pixels within the image of the target. So they all have their advantage and disadvantage in some ways. If I zoom in, if I have to fix this, maybe, uh, maybe add, oops. B for brush, always being the brush tool when doing this. I think it's good. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you know what? It's good enough. Let's say I do see an area I can fix here and there. You can definitely, you know, add or subtract it, right? Good to go. Q again. 
Here's my selection, Command J, copy paste. We're going to call this top right corner. Okay, top right corner, so we can then identify where this piece is later on. It's like it's like a puzzle. We're piecing together a puzzle with these pieces. So eventually, we're going to reconstruct these pieces to regenerate the scene. Okay. So we're going to hide them for now. Okay. I'm going to go back to the original and keep gathering more evidence. Okay. Sometimes you might be missing a piece and you have to find it or reconstruct it or something. So we got three to go. We got one, one two, and three. So let's move on to, I don't know, let's go to the left one. Okay. I'm going to show you another new tool that came into existence after this exercise. And that is the object selection tool. This is like cheating, borderline cheating. Okay. Because this one, basically, all you do is you hover the mouse. You wait a few seconds. You wait a few seconds. Oh, it's not working. Okay, if it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't have the, the algorithm or the power to recognize. Usually it works fine. There we go. It's picking that person up. If it doesn't work, here's what you do. You select a target like this one. You surround the pixels that you want to focus on. So you do this. Watch me carefully. I let go of the mouse, and it should gather my selection. Now, I know this is nice, and it's like, you know, this is the best method. It is, and it's not, so be careful. I want you to learn as much as you can, but this one does look really good, actually. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. It does, does the job. So when you use this, that's fine, but trust me, you're learning, so practice all the methods I'm showing you, all three. Magnetic, quick selection tool, and um, this is the object selection tool, okay? So copy and paste again, Command J. Whoops. It's gonna be the bottom. Bottom left, okay? That's the piece there. And let's just move it just for, just for visual cue there. Let's go back to this one. This time I'm going to use the, let's try this one again. It's not picking it up. Uh, let's use this one, the, the quick selection tool. Click and drag the mouse, just like that. Press Q, okay? Fix it if you have to. Go to the brush tool, right? Maybe you might have to maybe add a few things over here. Maybe have to press X and take a few things over there, whichever way you see fit. Fix it. Okay, go through the edges, right? Oh, look, there's a little area here. Maybe I want to straighten this edge out. Maybe it's too, you know, um, too rigid, right? So I'm going to go hold shift and just kind of do that. With shift, I just did a nice straight line. And you can also fix some other imperfected areas, okay? Like this as a spot over here. See this one here? Make the brush smaller. Whoops, press X and just take out this area. Actually, that wasn't bad. Maybe I can go press X again and just do it more um, inwards like this. All right, again, uh, do, do the best you can. You don't have to get, uh, you know, I mean, as long as it looks reasonable, it should work, okay? Don't spend like two hours on one piece, okay? Like limit yourself. Hi, Professor, yeah. for me, whenever I'm doing, I mean, I just did control C and V and I also did control J. It says could not make a new layer from the selection because the selected area is empty. But I did select something. But make sure, okay. Sounds like you did the right thing, but make sure like see me doing this right now. If I'm in this layer and I press command J, or if, if I do, it's going to tell me the same thing because this selection doesn't exist there. So if I go here, See, you're in the wrong layer. Make sure you're in the background layer whenever you extract. So make sure you're in the background layer. Make sure the selection is active. Look, I'll press Q just to kind of see it. And then I do Command J. And then there's the layer. Okay. Okay. So make sure make sure you're in the background layer all the time. Okay. All right. Very good. Good question. I'm going to move this up as well. So now you can see here. <clears throat> Look, all of the evidence is getting back together here. One more piece I'm missing is 
the other one let's grab it very quickly i'm in the background layer always always i go to the quick selection tool when i use the magnetic when i use this other one it's up to you there's three ways of doing this that are quite highly effective and i'm just gonna go use the quick selection tool here okay uh, grab an area here press q zoom in there's a few spots i can fix here definitely go to the brush tool make the brush a little bigger and basically press x and take out these little pieces here right so maybe um oops All right maybe uh, take away press x again All right and if it's a serious case like you are gonna spend look Maybe if it's this a real thing, you you might spend 10 hours doing this. That's okay. It's the job. You get paid for 10 hours, so you do this for 10 hours, right? It's just how it is in terms of, um, you know, you're establishing your time on what you have to do. So now that we have that done, I press Q again. There's my selection. I'm in the background layer. You have to be in the source layer. In this case, this resides in here. So I have to be there. Finally, I do Command J, copy and paste. This is called left middle, okay? Because there's top, top, uh, right, center, middle, bottom, left, all these different angles. So I'll call it left middle. I'm gonna hide the background layer. I'm gonna make all the other layers visible. I'm gonna select the move tool. Make sure auto select layers on. If it's not, what happens is if you click here, it's gonna select the layer that's selected from here, not from here. So you have to literally go here, and then move this here. And some people prefer this. Some people prefer the more object-oriented selection method, which is having auto select layer enabled and then moving things back and forth. So what you wanna do in this case is select this piece, okay? Um, you can show transform controls on and off. This might work, okay? I'm gonna use this for now since it's there, why not? Now watch carefully. Uh, since I'm pivoting it from here, I mean, I could do this, but I'd rather do this. I'm gonna move this registration right to the corner here. So it's like putting like a like a like a thumbnail, like a like one of those tacks or nails. And then if you grab the corner now, it pivots on that position. It's like, it's like an anchor of registration. Okay, you press enter, and then that becomes there. Do not grab it by the center because that just moves this. Rather than grab it by the anywhere but the center, okay, to move the layer. So I'm gonna move it there, okay? Click on the next one. Now watch this, I'm gonna position it here. Watch my anchor, I'm gonna move it right where they join, which is this corner here of the joint position. I'm gonna move my cursor on the outside. That's the only way to rotate it. And I'm gonna snap it back to the way it's supposed to be, which is like that. I'm going to press the enter button and I'm going to use the arrow keys on the keyboard. I'm going to go left, 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 up, 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 down, down, whichever way you see fit to reconstruct the photo. OK, click on the next layer, do the same thing. I'm going to move this here. The joint position is in this little corner here, this corner right here on the left side. As you can see, this is where I'm going to join it, right? Right over here. Can you see my cursor? right here. So that, therefore, I'm going to move this registration point right here where they meet. And then I'm going to zoom out slightly so I can get a better perspective on this, grab the corner and simply anchor it and, and rotate it right in the right place. Maybe like that. Press enter. Same thing with this one. Move it over here. Uh, in this case, I'll, the joint position happens to be in the corner up here. So I'm going to move the registration to that position here and grab the rotation angle and put this right back where it's supposed to be. Notice how I'm judging my space by simply doing this and going up, up, up with the arrow keys. You know, you can't go wrong using the, the keyboard. Eh? It's just so precise and delicate sometimes. Last piece is this one. We're going to move it right here where it belongs. The anchoring will be in this corner, this corner here. I'm going to grab the registration, pivot it. It's like a pivot point right there. Grab the corner and position it right where it's supposed to be. And press enter and just move it up a little bit. 
and this is pretty much how this will be. Now, this piece is a little off, so I have to maybe do some slight adjustments. Moving the arrow keys. And again, when you when you go ahead and uh, get this to look close to perfect, you can make all the ma minor adjustments that are necessary for you to get this thing to look the way it's supposed to. Okay. And this one here. Right, you get the idea. We do have a little bit of a hole in the middle. If you want to take the time to fix that, go ahead. But I mean, all in all, this is what I'm looking for, for you to demonstrate how to basically reconstruct any type of evidence or photographic um, assembly. I'm going to go to the crop tool finally and just crop this image like that. Press enter. All right. And pretty much this is the next assignment. I'm going to give you a week to do this. OK, I want you to practice all these techniques and tools. So listen, you're learning quick masking, a very powerful powerful technique that's used by professionals in conjunction with all the selection methods in Photoshop. Plus we learned color range. So basically we covered all the main selection methods up till now. Okay. So we're going to go file, save as this will be saved as torn underscore reconstructed. Okay, and, and by the way, put your name on these assignments. So I know it's your file. Always name your project files, save it on to your destination and upload it, please, before next week's class. So you have this thing uploaded. So we scratch off another little, you know, in-class assignment off the list, okay? All right, so that's it in terms of our exercises for this morning the only thing i have left to do is show you some student example of the movie poster project so just give me one second to get that ready and please if you have any questions always feel free to ask i'm going to go ahead and get this uh, chat window up and running all right all right so what um just give me a moment here to unplug and replug my drive because i just you know these new computers don't have USBs. I'll have USB C, so I have to you have all these adapters to hook up my my uh, external hard drives. So just give me a moment to do that. I'm gonna just quickly should be done by now. Yeah, it's done. All right. I'm gonna stop sharing for one second. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, for example, now how we um, rearrange the puzzles here in this picture. So we still have some cracks, crack lines going over the entire picture when we uh, arrange it together. So are we fixing it or we are just submitting it like that or is it for, for some another day? That's for another day because I have other examples to cover those imperfected areas. But for now, the evidence should be sufficient for for um, for somebody to do investigation or something like that. So it should be OK. OK, thank you. you want I have a question. As well. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to ask if we submit as PSD or PNG or JPEG. Oh, yeah. So basically this one will be a PSD so I can see it done. OK. Uh, if All right, you want, thank you. Let, yeah, no problem. Let me see the criteria here because I kind of forgot myself. Photo restoration. Uh, oh, yeah, it doesn't say, does it? Okay. Yeah, give me a PSD file. Uh, even if you give me a JPEG or PNG is okay because, but the PSD file shows me how you did it. So tell you what, I'm going to actually go ahead and put that in there. A PSD file, just so you know. I'll share my screen in a moment, okay? is to be submitted thank you for pointing that out so you can see that now let me just quickly go to my i got so many windows open up here all right here we go plug this guy in Give me a moment here. I'm trying to load this up. 
we have Uh, 23. Okay, I think I found it here. Alrighty, Photoshop project. So I'm going to copy this folder and I'm going to show you all the goodies. It's a big folder. That's why I have to copy it over here. All right, let me share my screen now so we can kind of see what I'm doing. Alrighty, so we have this folder copying here this is from this is last year this is fall 2023 so the same class i used to teach in the fall semester okay i know i had another class after that i want to show you more recent stuff but this is pretty recent so it'll be pretty good it'll just take three minutes i did do an update thanks to uh i think kamal was it with uh with the inquiry. So I, I did mention a PSD file is to be submitted because I can see the layers and all the work that you did. So this is a good way for you to, when you submit assignments, always give me a Photoshop file just so I can see all the work you did. Otherwise, how am I supposed to know your integration with layers and techniques and all the other stuff, right? So I'm pretty good at judging and seeing stuff like that. So make sure you do a PSD file right there. All right, so this is almost ready. It's like 20 gigabytes, so just be patient. While that's happening, yeah, so all you're doing is basically submitting this and you're giving me a reconstructed version of it. So it's gonna look like this. Did I even save it? I know I saved it somewhere, there it is. All right, so it's gonna look like that. And yeah, look at the, you know, the benefit is, I mean, you can do this, do this, no problem. This is a useful skill to have because not a lot of people can do this kind of work, right? Especially if you don't have the software. Photoshop is obviously one of the best programs in the planet for digital imaging, reconstruction, photo retouching. Uh, you asked about this little hole here. I mean, yeah, we can always grab pixels from this area, add it to this area and, and, and perfect it. I mean, if you give me another 10, 15 minutes, I can make this thing look flawless, but I'll leave that up to you, okay? If you wanna dabble with the other tools, but nonetheless, I'm looking for something like this. So it looks like it's reconstructed and, and you did all the all the work that's required. All right. Okay, it's about a minute left. It's almost there. Let's see what else we got here. Can you show so, the last step again, just to combine all those things? The last step, like the the rotations and stuff? No, not the rotation, uh, like after selecting all of those, getting mm -hmm. them together. Oh, the cropping. Yeah, so I use the crop tool, this one here, and I basically re re resized the document. So I made it look like this. And I just press enter. So basically, I just made the document more fitted to the actual target. So I use the crop tool. This is the last step is cropping the image. No, no. No, I'm not asking this. So after we made all those um, layers, how did mm -hmm. you combine all these layers? I didn't really combine them. I just have them. They're, they're still separate. Like all the layers are still separate. See, you know what I mean? They're not combined. The way I put them together was using my transform technique. I used the show transform button. I, I made the pivot thing here. And I just kind of did this, right? And I moved them in place. That's how I put this together. Okay. I didn't really combine anything. I just kind of, it looks like, but it's still separate, right? Okay. Okay. All right. And again, this is recorded. So when you watch the video, you can watch, watch all the little steps it did along the way as well. In case you did miss a few. Well, okay. and what if I can see? Oh, sorry. I'll go ahead. 
Uh, so what can I do if I don't see my rotational point in the selections? So what I would do in that case, and that's my NASV, right? Or whoever asked the question. What? Let's say you don't. I know some of you had this throw transform option issue back in last lesson. If you did that, get that resolved or not, I don't know. But here's another technique that I would do. Let's say I'm doing this layer here, right? So what you do is you go to edit, free transform, okay? Same thing. You can pivot this here and, mm. and go, go outside and, and only outside you can rotate. Inside you move, outside you rotate or scale okay. corner, right? You don't want to scale. Just do rotate and position, all right? So okay, edit, thank you. Yeah, free transform. I'll be honest with you. I've done this exercise before using this method, not this method. I just wanted to kind of switch it up and show you how this works as well. It's it's a little more cumbersome or, you know, I mean, it works, but you have to be careful because it could kind of, a lot of people might make the mistake and not know how to press enter or forget to remove this registration point. So you got to know how to move this or how to move this. This is this. And this is this. So be careful not to drag the center because you're moving the registration. You want to move this, you got to move it from here, not from here. That's the only difference. Okay. All right. Let's go okay, and now. You. You're very welcome. Now let's go ahead and, um, as I promised all of you, I'm going to show you some of the previous uh, student work that were delivered with some of these projects. Okay. You also have a composite project that you're going to get introduced to very soon. You're going to have uh, the movie poster, which is here, the book cover. I'm going to go one at a time, not to overwhelm you with everything. Let's stick to the movie posters here. Okay, so these are some of the movie posters I received from my class last fall. Okay, and you can see uh, some of them are PDFs because the file does get big. So you have to save like a PDF file and then a PSD file as well. Because when you print a poster in InDesign or other programs, you got to produce a PDF. So a lot of times you're going to give me both and kind of like, you know, zip them together and hand them in. And I'll cover that next time as well. By the way, the movie poster, we'll do an exercise next week. For now, I want you to think of a theme, gather your sources and start doing your story like your 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 not the mood board, your thumbnails, like how you're going to prepare it. Very quickly, when you create a new file for the movie poster, you want to go to print. You want to make sure this is set to tabloid. Sorry, make sure it's set to inches. You click on tabloid. Tabloid is 11 by 17. This is the criteria for the movie poster. Most movie posters are vertical. If you're doing a Netflix premiere, it might be horizontal. Go with vertical or horizontal, whichever one you want to do. Most people go vertical. Make sure the resolution is 300 DPI because that's what the print setting does. You click on CMYK color. If you forget, you can always do it after, but it's good to do it before. You press create, and then you start doing your movie poster. Okay, and we'll do a quick reconstruct next week of something fun. We're going to do lots of fun things next time. But for now, if you want to get started, this is how you start. And you start going file, place, embedded or linked, okay? Uh, we'll cover the difference, but for now, use embedded. That's the default Photoshop way that used to be all the time for the past two decades. This was newly introduced, which you can edit external linked images now, which is sometimes a problem if you lose them. So make sure you stick with this one for now. Okay, let's go ahead and put this um, picture here. And there it is, right? Press enter. Grab another picture, place it, and start putting your montage together. And then you can do lots of fun things with this. Okay. So, this is how you start your movie poster. Like I said, we'll do like a, a construction next week. And that gives us another week or two to get this thing done. Okay. So, don't leave it like the last minute. You can start already. But, um, you know, just the main thing is come up with the theme. Let's show you some of what my students did in the past. So, this is. Uh, a movie poster here. I guess it's a Netflix original called Emily in Paris. And you can see there's the Netflix logo and, and all the other stuff that's there. Now, I'm looking for authenticity. So make it look like a movie poster poster, okay? Like this looks okay, but there's a lot more details you can add to make it look more authentic. Another one is over here. And okay, this is Taxi. 
and you can see how it looks a little more authentic with a little motion picture stuff here you can you can type all the credits um you know the director the co-star the producer the actors they do that on movie posters so it looks like a nice nostalgic type of piece there's another one over here a harry potter movie poster same thing okay get all get all the details in there the pg-13s whatever you see on these posters because you want this to look authentic when you show it to people you don't want them to say that's a project that's like a real real movie poster Sometimes there's a little bit of a caption, okay, or, or an actual tagline for the movie. And then there's the actual main title or the main logo and design. There's another one over here. Some, some of them are made up, okay? I think I don't think this movie even happened, but okay, Man of Steel. I know Man of Steel was the actual movie, but I don't know if he fought this particular character. I think it's Black Adam or something. I can't remember, right, but that's another movie as well. And here's another one, Breaking Bad. We all know that show, very popular show on Netflix. With the smoke effect and pretty much capturing all the main characters and stuff. Barbershop 4. Okay, different genres, different movies. But see lots of this stuff if I was to <laughs> show you here the Photoshop file because I kept the smaller files because the stuff gets big, you know. It's even yeah. so there it is, right? So even Photoshop can preserve the layers. You see, like you can basically everything here that I'm selecting, oh, right? See, everything is draggable, right? Oops. There's all the layers, okay? Sometimes even the people are separated. Like he put himself in the movie. This is the gentleman that was one of my students. So he put himself in the movie as well. Okay, so you can have some fun with this. That's all good, right? So you can do lots of things by putting this whole thing together, like a montage. All right. Um, there's another one over here. Penzin. All right, and if I do open these files, you can see the amount of work that students put into this. This is like some of the some of the uh, layer masks, which we'll cover next week. So you're going to learn how this was done too. Okay, so next week's another crucial lesson for you to apply these additional effects. But for now, you have the knowledge and the know-how how to put images together. At least get the theme going. As far as the details are concerned, you can also do that. In the, in the last week let's say when it's due but this stuff you can all do on your own right now so maybe getting these people or these images all that stuff needs to be done you can see the amount of layers and effects that they use this is the background it's different backgrounds different effects movie strips right all the details and it's really fun. I mean, you know, uh, how, how can you not have fun doing a movie poster, right? I'm sure all of you have a favorite movie or genre or something that you're into. See, there you go. Another one here, 2023. The um, very famous um, Fast and Furious. This one's also interesting. Interstellar, great movie. But see the work that went into this? Just to show you, the student really went and like, look at all the different layer like this. I'm going to also show you how to create layer folders. These are groups. So these are different groups that you can create in Photoshop. Okay. With different lighting effects, with different, um, you know, color adjustments, overlays, layer masks. Right, so all these are different things to organize because you're going to end up with a lot of layers. You're going to group them like this. You see, all these are all groups. And how do you group a layer? You simply select a number of layers and you press Command G, like you would in Illustrator. But you can also make a folder and group the layers that way as well. Okay, so you can see lots of interesting things here with this one. Nice, nicely done. All right, let's keep going here. This is another one over here. See, different designs, different uh, styles, right? 
this one again, if I show you the Photoshop file, you can see how it was done in different layer segments. Like all these images obviously are, you know, individual, right? Oops. Got to take off this show transform button, right? Oh, they're locked layers. That's why. Oopsie. All right. There we go. So if I unlock the layers, so you can kind of. One quick way to unlock the layers is basically. If you select. To lock layers is very important. This is how you lock the layers. And when you lock the layer, you can't really move it like I'm trying to do right now to show you. But all these images that are here. Basically, you can move and select at any given time. There we go. Okay, so you can move things. Auto select layer. There we go. Now it's easier, right? So you can see how it's all constructed using different layers and selection methods and locking, unlocking layers. We'll get through all the little details after with things. A lot of stuff you figure out on your own. Like you can see lock to unlock. Like this moves it, doesn't move it. So we can see different ways of integrating uh, things. There's another one just in time for Halloween. The scary stuff comes along, right? You can see all the backgrounds, all the different effects and textures and things like that. Okay. Nice effects with the titles. That's when you learn how to do layer styles. I told you all genres we cover from kids movies to horror movies to fiction, comedy, sci-fi, you name it, right? So that's why I love getting these projects from students. Here's another one here. Yes, that's the. This one was a lot of work as well. Sometimes the preview doesn't do justice because it looks different. See all the layers that are incorporated. Right. Right, so there's a lot of different uh, blend modes, effects, layer layer um, masks, and stuff like that. Right, so we can put this thing together. Very nicely done. We we'll do that one already. This one here. Some are tragic. Some are real events. The famous Squid Game show. And this one here. This one. Right. There you go. Hack on the, even some anime. If you're into anime, we got some of that too. Right. So you can see, like, I love this. Uh, group that I selected because it kind of covers all the genres out there with movies because I know all of you have different tastes to movies perhaps different uh, areas and you can pick your favorite movie and just make a poster whether it's something that's coming up or whether it's something that you enjoy you can totally be as creative as you want all right did that kind of give you a good example of um of, of what to do with this next project I did I do the same thing every semester. Yep. What I showed those students was the students before them. What I'm showing you now is the students before you. So I'm, be, I'm going to be showing your projects to the next group. So that's exactly how this keeps going on and on. And it's fun because I always get very, very nice and interesting uh, projects all the time. Now, next week, I'm going to go over this again. We'll probably design a movie poster in class. OK, I'll do something like a theme just to go over some of the techniques. We'll put something together. We'll cover like uh, like layer effects, which we haven't covered yet. Um, layer masks we covered today, so I want to see that integrate. That's the most powerful technique is what I showed you today. It's very powerful layer masks, selections, layers. Everything else is kind of secondary, OK? Like the effects and, you know, even the layer blends. I mean, they can only do so much, but they do help. So next week I will cover the other stuff. So you'll have everything that you need to know going forward like a week after to get this done. All right.
Any questions? Professor, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, is it okay to you combine two softwares or strictly we need to stick to one? Well, this is a Photoshop class, so ultimately I want you to create Photoshop files. However, if you, let's say using a 3D software to render something in 3D and you want to um, render it and put it into Photoshop, that's fine. That shows me that okay, you're versatile you. and yeah, in other programs. Illustrator is another good one. You, I, I'll, next week I'll do an example, like let's say like Attack on Titan. Let's say you want to do a title for, you know, an anime production or something. You might have to go to Illustrator to make the vector files uh, happen and then you bring those vector files into Photoshop. That's also fine. OK. All right. All as right. long as as long as Photoshop is your last source of application, you can use other yes. sources, but Photoshop is your main delivery. OK. Right. Thank you. Right. Very good. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because there's nothing else to show you. Any other questions? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, so it's been a fun day again. Nice to see all of you. Hope you're having a, a good week so far, and I'll see you in the next class. Same time, same place, and have fun out there doing your Photoshop assignments and projects and the other ones as well. Okay, bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thank you Thank professor. You. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye.